Hello and welcome back to my channel and my Michael Powell retrospective. And now we reach... Ah... Black Narcissus. Oh yeah. This is decadent cinema, my friends. Cinema to bathe in. Every single frame of Jack Cardiff's colour cinematography is lick the screen gorgeous. Those fantastic faces. This is a film of faces. Deborah Carr, so beautiful. Gene Simmons. And of course, Kathleen Byron. I could do an entire video on Kathleen Byron's face in this film. One of the great faces in world cinema with those wonderful murderous eyes. Do you remember that fantastic shot when Deborah Carr looks down at her pencil and the camera moves across and you see the murder? The hysteria in Kathleen Byron's eyes. That fantastic scene at night when Deborah Carr comes in to Sister Ruth's cell. And there she is, the Jezebel, the strumpet, lit up in lurid red light. And then she puts on that red, red lipstick. I'm fascinated by Kathleen Byron's teeth. I can't take my eyes off her teeth. You know when she says, all the same. I noticed you'd like to see them yourself. You know, I can't stop looking at her teeth. Her face is magnificent. And then at the end, when she comes out for that duel on the cliffside with Deborah Carr, and her, her hair and her eyes, you know, they've almost got black makeup around her eyes. Incredible shot. This is cinema. It's, it's, it's the cinematic equivalent of taking a long bath in a sunken bath full of oils and unguents and eastern perfumes. You can smell it on your skin. It's that kind of cinema. It's not beautiful or respectable cinema. It's gorgeous, you know, cinema to sink into. I love it to pieces. Alfred Younger's incredible um, production design, the design of the rooms of this uh, convent, which used to be a harem, and the brilliant matte paintings of the surrounding Himalayas. What a gorgeous film this is. Now, many people through the years have liked Black Narcissus. I have always considered this my favorite Pal Pressburger film. I can see the thematic richness of Colonel Blimp, the light on its feet genius of A Matter of Life and Death, the beautiful off-kilter romance of I Know Where I'm Going, and the gorgeous, subtle depth of A Canterbury Tale. But I still go back to Black Narcissus. But not everyone likes Black Narcissus, and chief amongst the people who didn't like it at the time was Rumour Godden. Now, Rumor Godden was the novelist upon whose work Black Narcissus was based. And it's important to look at Rumor Godden and what she thought about Black Narcissus. Rumor Godden was born in India to an English family. She was born in Bengal in 1907. And she grew up in India and was completely in love with India and considered it her home, even though, of course, she was an outsider. And her books are, are sort of romances. They're quite Mills and Boonish, actually. They're not really high literature. But they are all intimately concerned with the position of the British person in India. Now, Rumor Godden did not like Black Narcissus at all and wasn't terribly keen on Michael Powell. But four years later, another film was based on her work, The River by Jean Renoir. And she did like this film a lot and she admired Renoir a lot. Now, these two films, Black Narcissus and the River, are two of my favourite films of all time. And they are my ideal double bill. If I was only allowed one double bill for eternity, it would be these two films. I love them to pieces and I'm fascinated by them and by comparing them. And what I'm going to say is this. I think Rumor Godden was wrong about Black Narcissus, but she was also right about The River. Let's see what I mean. The River is a novel about... A young girl growing up in an English colonial family. They run a business. And next door is a young Indian girl of the same age. And an American a veteran of the Second World War comes into their midst and they both fall in love with him. And in falling in love with him, it's a rites of passage of these girls in life and they come to understand themselves as women. There's actually an, also a third character played by Adrienne Corrie in the film. So it's, it's a story of teenage girls coming you know, into womanhood, basically. Black Narcissus, on the other hand, is about women who've already come into womanhood, but are now falling apart. They've come to this nunnery up in the Himalayas. They're trying to build a nunnery and a, a sort of teaching school and a hospital for the local people. 
But something about the air in this place affects them and they fail. So you see, one of these films is about maturing. And it's also about coming together and understanding each other. So these three girls all falling for the same men almost becomes an analogy for coming to the same place, the same understanding together. Renoir's film is a film of unity. It's a film of understanding and it's a film of love. But Michael Powell's film is a film of separation. The irreconcilable differences between the nuns, the English, in the nunnery and the people outside. It's also a film of hysteria. It's a film of lust. And you can see this all the way through the two films. So, for example, both films have an important death in them. One of these deaths is two women on a ridiculously high cliff fighting each other and one of them falls to her death. The other death is a death that is so beautifully shot, one of the great death moments, Dave can call a death scene in films. In Renoir's The River, the little boy of the White family, he goes looking for a snake in the afternoon. We cut to all the members of the family, all the people involved in the drama, and they're all asleep, all the same, lying in the afternoon heat. Humanity brought together, if you like, at rest. And then this montage finishes with the sight of the boy lying in the grass in the dark, in the, in the afternoon. But he's not asleep. He's dead. He's been bitten by the snake. Yet this moment of tragedy is not lurid, it's not hysterical. It's actually a beautiful moment of unity of all the people in the film. It's a beautiful way of doing it. Whereas Powell's film is a lurid, you know, melodramatic nightmare. Similarly, both films have a major dance sequence. Now, the dance sequence in Jean Renoir's The River is played by the young Indian girl in the film, who was played by uh, Radha, who was actually a classical dancer, and she taught this uh, in Bengal. And the way that uh, Renoir films this dance, this is the dance of a woman, a girl who's finally becoming a woman, finally realising the nature of her love, and is getting married. The camera withdraws to a distance, films a complete you know, long shot, so the whole body very respectful, and watches her do this beautiful dance. This dance of love, this dance of joining with someone else at a respectful distance. When we go to Black Narcissus, we watch Jean Simmons dance. Jean Simmons is a young teenager. She's a bit wild, she's a bit crazy. She's brought to the nuns to control her. And we see her, she's in a room, which used to be the room of the harem. And she dances around the harem room then at the end she comes towards the feet of Sabu, this young prince, drops down and sort of looks up at him like a child. And later we'll have a repeated shot of that when they're in the classroom and Sabu, the Indian prince who's come for lessons with the nuns, she crawls to the partition between him and the girls and she looks under like a little girl looking up. You see the two differences between the films. One is about coming together, maturing, womanhood, the other is about the crazy hysteria of teenagehood, of people collapsing back into lust and hysteria. The key difference with how these directors approach these two films, which are very different in theme, was that Renoir insisted in the river that it had to be filmed in India. He wouldn't make the film unless he went to India. And when he went to India, he fell in love with it. And he didn't see it as mysterious or strange. He saw it as his home almost a home from home, a second trance. That's what God had loved, because she also felt at home in India. But Powell decided extraordinarily, no, we're going to film the whole thing in Pinewood in England. Almost the entire thing is set in studios. Rumor God thought this was crazy. I think it's brilliant. Why? Because that choice represents the people in the film. A group of nuns, or English people, holding themselves up in some eerie above the local population, just like the English Raj went to Simla, these kind of resorts, where they sort of kept themselves apart from the local population. 
you know, and became and stayed very English with English tea and English games, right? This and then in this world, in comes almost like an invasion. The sights and sound, the smells, the perfumes, the culture, it sort of invades through the walls. And it's like a single mind, if you like, being traumatised by the outside external forces, which it cannot stop. So to build it entirely within a studio, not to go to India at all, but to treat India as almost a fantasy, and then to keep everything claustrophobic inside in the studio, is the exact right decision. It's the perfect formal, you know, analogy of what the film is showing, what the film is talking about, the ludicrousness of the English trying to keep themselves apart, yet still rule. That's exactly what the film is about. And so Powell's decision to make this kind of lurid fever dream completely set in this claustrophobic studio absolutely suits the material. The script... I think the way that Pressburger plays with Goddard's film is very clever. There are all sorts of dichotomy, you know, sort of contrasts. So the film starts with this long, low blast of the horns of the Himalayan people, and it goes straight into Brian Easdale's very Western orchestral music. The film starts with that. And all the way through, these contrasts are played upon. So, for example, we know that these nuns will be temporary, as, you know, the David Farrow uh, character says, you know, you'll be gone before the rains come. Yet up on the hill, just behind them, is an Indian man who has stayed rooted to the spot, not said a thing, and he's been there for years. You know, and what is also interesting about that, and this is also one of the things that I like about Godin's, script, uh, Godin's writing, actually, is it turns out that this man, this holy man, has actually been trained with the British Army and is actually a modern man. Similarly, in Jean Renoir's The River, the porter of the, of the family, the white family, is actually an ex-soldier who served with the British. Godden, as well as Pressburger, plays with these dichotomies. We also have this wonderful scene in the classroom where the little boy is teaching English words, and it says, guns, bullets, warships, <laughs> bayonets, and then it changes to daffodils, peonies. You know, a brilliant wry satire on the British system. And of course that also reflects on a later scene, one of my favourite scenes in the film, where the gardening sister, you know, Deborah Carr finds out that instead of planting vegetables, useful functional things, she's given herself up to this atmosphere and she started planting beautiful flowers, honeysuckle, daffodils, peonies, a beautiful scene. And there's... It's a wonderful moment where Deborah Carr comes out and says, what are you doing? You know, and, she, and the woman said, I can't help it. This place has got to me. And she said, well, look, we'll pray together. We'll work together. And the gardening sister shows her hands and they're completely covered in calluses. An incredibly moving moment. So the whole film plays with these dichotomies, you know, to give this impression that the English here, these nuns, don't really belong. There's two lines of dialogue about this film, which I think really sum it up. One is that the David Farrow character says, this is the kind of place you either give yourself up to or you ignore it completely. I think that kind of sums up the film. You either give yourself up to this film and lose yourself in it, or you kind of reject it. And there's other, something else that he says, there's something in the air here which is exaggerated. And that is what this film is. Renoir in the river went for a sort of near-realist, truthful, humanistic portrait of the English in India. But that's not what Powell was interested in. Powell was interested in the exaggeration of it. The English in India is a kind of fever dream, a kind of madness. I love these two films passionately. I once wrote an article about them uh, on the internet, which I will leave a link to below. Black Narcissus, I know probably Blimp and Matter of Life and Death and The Red Shoes and made, made, made me greater films. I love this film so much. It will always be close to my heart. It's a masterpiece in my opinion and a very lurid one. See you next time.